Greetings. I hope that you and your loved ones are in utmost good health and in good cheer amid these trying times caused by the coronavirus pandemic. This video is created for the benefit of my second year College of Law student to supplement the review on the rules on criminal procedure. This video will cover the rules and relevant jurisprudence with respect to arraignment and plea covered by Rule 116 of the Rules on Criminal Procedure. This video would likewise discuss the rules and jurisprudence as regards pre-trial under Rule 118 of the Rules on Criminal Procedure. Also, before I forget, a gentle reminder that the discussions in this video are not comprehensive as this is merely a review. All right, let us proceed. What is arraignment? How do we define arraignment? As can be called from the fifth edition of Black's Law Dictionary, arraignment as a concept may be defined as a procedure whereby the accused is brought before the court to plead to the criminal charge in the indictment or information. The charge is consequently read to him and he is asked to plead guilty or not guilty. Now, in our jurisdiction, in the case of People versus Pangilinan, GR number 171020, March 14, 2007, the Supreme Court had the opportunity to define arraignment as the formal mode and manner of implementing the constitutional right of an accused to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation against him. Now, what is the purpose of arraignment? In the same case, the Supreme Court held that the purpose of arraignment is thus to apprise the accused of the possible loss of freedom, even of his life, depending on the nature of the crime imputed to him, or at the very least, inform him of why the prosecuting arm of the state is mobilized against him. It should also be noted that arraignment is a vital stage in criminal proceedings in which the accused is formally informed of the charges against him or her. The proper conduct of the arraignment is provided in Rule 116 of the Revised Rules on Criminal Procedure. Now, a perusal of these provisions or the provisions of these rules shows that arraignment is not a mere formality but an integral part of due process. Particularly, it implements the constitutional right of the accused to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation against him or her, and their fight or their right to speedy trial. Now, question class. What if the accused objected to the validity of his arrest or to the jurisdiction over his person as an accused after he has formally pleaded or after the arraignment proceeding has been conducted? Should the said objection of the accused be sustained? Is the objection valid? The answer is no. It should not be sustained. The objection is not valid. Why? The Supreme Court answered this in the case of People versus Mandraga, 344 Skra, 628, 2000. In this case, the court has repeatedly ruled that by entering a plea upon arraignment, and by actively participating in the trial, an accused is deemed to have waived any objection to his arrest. In relation thereto, in People v. Batong Og, GR number 142-356, April 14, 2004, the Supreme Court held that any objection to the arrest or acquisition of jurisdiction over the person of the accused must be made before he enters his plea. Otherwise, the objection is deemed waived. So that is clear. Any question or objection as to the validity of the arrest of the accused or as to the acquisition of jurisdiction over the person of the accused must be raised before the accused enters his plea or before the proper conduct of arraignment proceeding. Otherwise, such questions or such objections shall be deemed waived. In like manner, class, 
it should also be emphasized that, as a general rule, any ground in a motion to quash should be raised prior to or before the accused enters his or her plea. Otherwise, the same is deemed waived. Again, as a general rule, if the accused files his or her motion to quash, assailing the validity of the complaint or information after entering a plea or after proper arraignment proceeding, the motion to quash should be denied as the same is deemed waived. Precisely, in the case of Miranda versus the Honorable Sandigan Bayan et al., GR number 154098, July 27, 2005, the, su the Supreme Court held that it is basic that entering a plea waives any objection the accused may have as to the validity of the complaint or information. However, this is merely the general rule class. There are exceptions to this rule. And the exceptions are if the ground to the motion to quash is, first, the information charges no offense. Second, the trial court has no jurisdiction over the offense charged. Third, the penalty or the offense has been extinguished. And lastly, double jeopardy has Now, a question may be interposed. May the delay in the conduct of the arraignment proceeding, may it cause the dismissal of the criminal case? The answer is yes, it is possible. Precisely, delay in the arraignment violates the right to speedy trial, as provided in Luman Lau v. Peralta, February 13, 2006. The Supreme Court emphatically held that vexatious, oppressive, unjustified, and capricious delays in the arraignment violates the constitutional right to speedy trial and speedy case disposition, particularly when the accused is detained. The court safeguards liberty and will therefore always uphold the basic constitutional rights of the people, especially the weak and the marginalized. So if it violates the right to speedy trial, it may, it may be a ground for the dismissal of the criminal case. Now, how should the accused be arraigned? This is answered in Rule 116, Section 1 of the Revised Rules on Criminal Procedure, which provides that the accused must be arraigned in the following manner. First, he shall be arraigned before the court where the complaint or information was filed or assigned for trial. It shall be made in open court by the judge or clerk by furnishing the accused with a copy of the complaint or information, reading the same in the language or dialect known to him, and asking him whether he pleads guilty or not guilty. Question. Is the presence of the accused required in his own arraignment? The answer is obviously yes. There is no such thing as arraignment by proxy in Philippine jurisdiction as a general rule. Okay? The accused must be present at the arraignment and must personally enter his plea. And both arraignment and plea shall be made of record. Another question. What is the effect if the accused refuses to enter a plea? Okay? When the accused refuses to plead or makes a conditional plea, a plea of not guilty shall be entered for him. Now, what if the accused enters a plea of guilty or a plea of guilt but presents exculpatory evidence? Okay? What happens then? Okay? His plea of guilty shall be deemed withdrawn and a plea of not guilty shall be entered for him. All right? Let's proceed to the presence of the offended party in arraignment proceedings. Now, we have already established that the presence of the accused is absolutely required. Now, question. Is the presence of the private offended party absolutely required for the validity of the arraignment proceedings? Otherwise stated, if the private offended party is absent, would that invalidate the arraignment proceedings? The answer is no. The answer is no. The absence of the private offended party in arraignment proceedings would not, would not invalidate the same. Now, what then is the purpose of the presence of the private offended party in arraignment proceedings, you may ask? Now, it is 
the private offended party shall be required to appear at the arraignment for purposes of first plea bargaining second determination of civil liability and third other matters requiring his presence now you may ask again what is the effect of failure of the private offended party to appear now in the case in case of failure of the private offended party to appear despite due notice the court may allow the accused to enter a plea of guilty to a lesser offense which is necessarily included in the offense charged with the conformity of the trial prosecutor alone okay because it is required that for a plea of a lesser offense necessarily included in the offense charge it must be with the consent of the private offended party and the public prosecutor now if the private offended party is absent during arraignment the consent may be had by the public prosecutor alone now question when should arraignment be conducted when kanusa the rules and relevant jurisprudence provides that unless a shorter period is provided by special law or any supreme court circular the arraignment shall be held within 30 days from the date the court acquires jurisdiction of the person the accused take note class arraignment shall be held within 30 days from the date the court acquires jurisdiction over the person of the accused now the time of dependency of a motion to quash or for a bill of particulars or other causes justifying suspension of the arraignment shall be excluded in computing this period now what is the process or what is the rule when the accused is under preventive suspension okay when the accused is under preventive suspension the following the following procedure procedure shall be observed first the case is raffled second the records transmitted to the judge to whom the case was raffled within three days from the filing of the information or complaint third the accused shall be arraigned within 10 days from the date of the raffle and lastly the pre-trial conference of his case shall be held within 10 days after arraignment this is important class because any delay any capricious vexatious delay as to the arraignment of the accused especially when he is uh, under preventive detention is considered as a violation of the accused right to speedy trial or the right of the accused to speedy disposition of case now let's proceed to plea bargaining what is this concept of plea bargaining in criminal cases well, basically, this is where the accused would or may enter a plea of guilty to a lesser offense necessarily included in the offense charge. Now, this is done during arraignment. And what are its requisites? First, that the lesser offense that is pleaded to by the accused is an offense necessarily included in the offense charge. The plea to a lesser offense must be with the consent of both the offended party and the public prosecutor. Now again, by way of review, if the offended party fails to appear at the time of arraignment of pretrial, despite due notice, the court may allow the accused to enter a plea of guilty to a lesser offense, which is necessarily included in the offense charge with the conformity of the trial prosecutor alone or the public prosecutor only okay now may the accused plead guilty to a lesser offense necessarily included in the offense charge after the arraignment but before the start of the trial this is allowed yes this is allowed as provided in rule 116 section 2 which provides that after arraignment but before trial the accused may still be allowed to plead guilty to said lesser offense after withdrawing his plea of not guilty. No amendment of the complaint or information is thus necessary. Now a question may be interposed. Would the accused, should the accused be allowed to plead guilty to a lesser offense necessarily included in the offense charge after the trial has begun or during the trial, during the presentation of evidence? It's allowed. Okay. The rule there is after the prosecution has rested its case, after the prosecution has 
presented its evidence, a change of plea to a lesser offense may be granted by the judge, may be granted by the judge with approval of the prosecutor and the offended party. The prosecution does not have sufficient evidence to establish the guilt of the accused for the crime charge. However, the judge cannot on its own grant the change of plea. So it is possible, class. It is possible. Okay? Now, question. What if the accused pleads guilty to a capital offense? What happens then? What is the duty of the court in that particular instance where the accused pleads guilty to a capital offense? Okay, what is designated as a capital offense? Life imprisonment and death. Okay, so what is the duty of the court in that instance? First, the court must conduct a searching inquiry into the voluntariness and full comprehension of the consequences of the plea of guilty. And the court should require the prosecution to present evidence to prove the guilt and precise degree of culpability of the accused despite the accused pleading guilty to the offense charge, which is a capital offense. Lastly, the accused may present evidence in his behalf, even if the accused pleads guilty to a capital offense. This is provided in Rule 116, Section 3 of the Revised Rules on Criminal Procedure. Again, class, if the accused pleads guilty to a to an offense which is a capital offense, there is no, no immediate rendering of judgment and penalty, class. Eh? Okay. Okay, take note of the duties of the court in that instance. Now, a question may be asked. What do we mean by this? Searching inquiry into the voluntariness and full comprehension of the consequences of the guilty plea by the accused. Okay, while there is no hard and fast rule in which the judge should conduct in a searching inquiry, there are, however, guidelines to how the judge should conduct his or her searching inquiry. Okay, merely guidelines, not a hard and fast rule. And what are these guidelines? Okay. The judge must ascertain from the accused himself or herself first how into the custody of the law. Second, whether he had the assistance of a competent counsel during custodial and preliminary investigation and under what conditions he was detained and interrogated during the investigation. Okay? The court should likewise ask the defense counsel a series of questions as to whether he had conferred with and completely explained to the accused, the meaning and consequences of his or her plea of guilt to a capital offense. The court must likewise elicit information about the personality profile of the accused, his economic status, his social status, his educational background, his or her age, which may serve as an index to his capacity to give a free and informed plea of guilty basing the AY Squila. What's a kabaloon sa ginabuhat? The court must ascertain as to the voluntariness and understanding of the accused to the plea of guilt to a capital offense. Next, the court should inform the accused the exact length of imprisonment or nature of the penalty under the law and the certainty that he will serve such sentence. Okay, it is certain that the accused will serve that sentence because of his plea of guilt to a capital offense. Okay. Subsequently, the court should likewise inquire if the accused should or the accused knows the crime which he is charged and fully explain to him or her the elements of the crime which is the basis of his indictment. And all questions posed to the accused should be in a language known and understood by the latter. Sinisaya, kung Nasdaba or Cebu or those Visayan dialects speaking regions in the Philippines. Tagalog, kung nas Manila, NCR. Okay? And lastly, the trial judge must satisfy himself that the accused in pleading guilty is truly guilty. The accused must be required to narrate the tragedy or reenact the crime or furnish its missing details. Klaroon sa agad sa korte. Kung siya bagyod 
or guilty bagid siya. Okay? That is why it is required that the prosecution present its evidence and also provide the opportunity to of provide the opportunity to the accused to present his evidence. All right, let's proceed to improvident plea of guilty to a capital offense. First, we must define what is this improvident plea of guilt. An improvident plea is one without proper information as to all the circumstances affecting it, based upon a mistaken assumption or misleading information or advice. Now, what is the effect of this improvident plea? Now, a plea of guilty should not be accepted and should not be held to be sufficient to sustain a conviction if the accused does not fully and clearly understand the nature of the offense charge and if he is not advised as to the meaning and effect of the technical language often used in formal complaints and information in qualifying the acts constituting the offense or if he does not clearly understand the consequences by way of a heavy and even capital penalty flowing from his admission, from the admission of his guilt of the crime. Now, when may an improvident plea be withdrawn? It may be withdrawn at any time before judgment of conviction becomes final. In this case, the court may permit an improvident plea of guilty to be withdrawn and substituted by a plea of not guilty. It's provided under Rule 116, Section 5, the Revised Rules on criminal procedure. However, it must be underscored that the withdrawal of said improvident plea is not a matter of right of the accused. Okay? It is subject to the sound discretion of the Honorable Court or of the All right. And with that, we are done with arraignment and plea. Let us proceed to pre-trial. Now, what rule governs the conduct of pre-trial? It is Rule 118. Now, preliminarily, let us discuss the purpose of pre-trial. What is its purpose? This is answered by Section 1, Rule 118, wherein it provides that the main objective of pre-trial in criminal cases is to achieve an expeditious resolution of the case. This proceeding is mandatory in criminal cases and is conducted before trial, before trial, that is why it is called pre-trial. Now, what criminal cases are covered by the mandatory conduct of pre-trial? Okay. Rule one one eight section one section one also provides that all criminal cases, all criminal cases, cognizable by the Sandigan Bayan, the RTC, the MATC, the MTCC, the MTC, and the MCTC. Okay, are required to conduct pre-trial proceedings in criminal cases. Now, when should pre-trial be commenced in criminal cases? Okay, the same section of Rule 118, Section 1, provides that the court shall order a pre-trial conference after arraignment and within 30 days from the date the court acquires jurisdiction of the person of the accused. Unless a shorter period be provided by special laws or Supreme Court circulars. Now, what are the matters that is discussed during pre-trial and criminal proceedings? First, plea bargaining or a plea to a lesser offense necessarily included in the offense charge. This was already sufficiently discussed previously in our topic on arraignment and plea. However, a question may be posed. I thought, sir that plea to a lesser offense necessarily included in the offense charge should be made prior to arraignment? Or is it included in the matters taken up during pre-trial? Firstly, it must be borne in mind that in actual court practice, in consonance with the continuous trial rule, arraignment and pre-trial are conducted in the same hearing incident as a general rule. Corollary thereto, if for some reason, arraignment and pre-trial are not conducted in the same hearing incident as we have previously discussed, the accused may still plead guilty to a lesser offense even after arraignment wherein he pleaded not guilty but before trial. How? How can this be done? By withdrawing his previous plea of not guilty 
and pleading guilty to a lesser offense necessarily included in the offense charge. It must also be noted, class, that a plea to a lesser offense necessarily included in the offense charge even with the consent of the private offended party and the public prosecutor, requires the approval of the court. Question. In case the offended party, the public prosecutor, and the accused mutually agreed to a plea of guilt to a lesser offense necessarily included in the offense charge, what are the actions of the court in such a case? The court shall issue an order which contains the plea bargaining arrived at Proceed to receive evidence on the civil aspect of the case because by way of review in criminal cases as provided in Article 100 of the Revised Penal Code, those criminally liable are also civilly liable, ex delicto, or civil liability arising from the crime. And lastly, the court shall render and promulgate judgment of conviction including the civil liability for or damages duly established by the evidence. Another matter which may be discussed during pre-trial are the stipulation of facts. How is this done? The parties, the prosecution and the defense, states their proposals for stipulation of the allegations which they seek the conformity of the other party. And the other party would manifest if they agree to the proposal for stipulation or not. Now why is this done? What is its purpose? This is to abbreviate the proceedings because those allegations already stipulated upon are not required to be proven anymore. No evidence would be presented to prove these allegations for the precise reason that they have already been stipulated upon. So the proceedings are obviously shortened, which is the very purpose of the conduct of pre-trial for the expeditious disposition of the case. Again, stipulations of facts are allowed in criminal cases. However, it should be emphasized, class, it should be emphasized, class, ha, that circumstances which would qualify a particular crime or offense that would increase the penalty to death cannot be stipulated upon. Take note of this, class, take note of this. Precisely in the case of People v. Sitao, alias Beto, GR number 146-790-2002. The Supreme, the Honorable Supreme Court emphatically held that circumstances that qualify a crime and increases its penalty to death cannot be the subject of stipulation. Again, this cannot be subject of stipulation. An accused cannot be condemned to suffer the extreme penalty of death on the basis of stipulations for his own admission. The strict rule is warranted by the seriousness of the penalty of death. Alright, marking for identification of documentary evidence or documentary exhibits are also included in pre-trial proceedings. How is this done? Okay, you present to the court a document and proceed to mark it as an exhibit. Exhibit A, etc. for the prosecution. Exhibit 1 etc. for the defense. Now, if it is the original document that is presented, then the same would be permanently marked. Now, if the original is not presented during pre-trial, then it is merely provisionally marked. And the original should be presented at the time it is identified by a competent witness. However, class, it should be noted that the 2019 revisions on the rules and evidence with respect to admissibility vis-a-vis -vis original documents should be noted. Anyway, this would be discussed in your evidence class, not in this subject. Now, what is the significance of this presentation and marking of documentary exhibits during pre-trial? Okay, its significance is because as a general rule, no evidence may be presented and offered during the trial other than those identified and marked during the pre-trial. However, there is an exception, except when allowed by the court for good cause shown. Now, modification of the order of trial is likewise discussed during pre-trial. 
As a general rule, the prosecution is the first to present his evidence. Why? Why is this so? Because the prosecution has the burden of proving the allegations of the complaint or information. However, by way of exception, the accused may, in some instances, be the first to present evidence when the accused interposes a defense of a justifying or exempting circumstance or circumstances to negate his or her criminal liability. Why is this so? Because the accused hypothetically admits the allegations of the complaint or information that he committed these acts which, which constitute a crime or offense. But there are certain justifying or exempting circumstances which would negate criminal liability. And as such, the prosecution no longer needs to prove the allegations of the complaint or information. It is now the accused who now has to prove his or her allegations that the justifying or accepting circumstances truly exist. So the accused should present his or her evidence first in this particular instance. Now, how is this done? The honorable judge would ask the counsel for the accused to manifest what is the defense. If the defense of the accused is denial and or alibi, then the prosecution presents evidence first. If the defense is the presence of a justifying or exempting circumstance or circumstances, then the accused or the defense presents evidence first. Now, other, ma other matters that will promote a fair and expeditious trial of the civil and criminal aspects of the case are also discussed during pre-trial proceedings. Now, let's proceed to pre-trial agreement. What are the requirements for a valid pre-trial agreement? First, it must be reduced into writing. Second, it should be signed by the accused and counsel. And third, it, is, it should be with the approval of the court if agreements covered matters in Section 1, Rule 118 or those matters which we have just discussed. Now, let's proceed to pre-trial order. Okay, What should the pre-trial order contain? Or what are the specifics of a pre-trial order? The pre-trial order shall be issued by the trial judge and shall be issued within 10 days after the termination of the pre-trial. And it should contain the following. The actions taken, the facts stipulated upon, the evidence marked, the admissions made, the number of witnesses and names of the witnesses, if known, to be presented, and the schedule of trial. Now, what is the effect of the issuance of a pre-trial order? What is the effect? of a pre-trial order. It binds the parties. It limits the trial to those matters not disposed of. What do, we, what do we mean by this, those matters not disposed of? Those matters which have not been stipulated upon. And the last effect, it controls the course of the action during trial unless modified by the court to prevent manifest injustice. Now, what does this mean? Control the course <coughs> of the action during trial. <coughs> It simply means that only those evidence marked and identified during pre-trial or exhibits that have been marked during pre-trial may be presented or may be admitted into evidence as a general rule. Also, only those numbers, number or names of witnesses stated in the pre-trial proceedings and in the pre-trial order are allowed to be presented as witnesses during trial as a general rule. Also, class, <clears throat> it should be noted that it is the counsel for the accused and the prosecutor who must be present during pre-trial. Is the accused required to be present during pre-trial? As a general rule, no. The accused is not required to attend pre-trial unless he or she is ordered by the court to do so. Now, who are required to be present during pre-trial in criminal cases? the prosecutor, and the counsel for the accused. Now, what is the effect if the prosecutor is absent? Would that result in the dismissal of the criminal case? No, it would not. Absence of the prosecutor during pre-trial does not result in the dismissal of the criminal case. How about absence of the counsel for the accused? Would that result in the presentation of evidence for the prosecution ex parte? Again, 
No, that would not be the result. The only effect would be the imposition of possible sanctions for the erring lawyer for non-appearance at the scheduled pre-trial in criminal cases. This is important to note because the rule is different in pre-trial in civil cases. It should likewise be underscored that the accused is not required to be present at the pre-trial as a general rule unless the court expressly requires the accused to be present thereat. Again, it should be underscored that the accused is not required to be present at pre-trial. This is merely a general rule. The exception would be if the court expressly requires the accused to be present thereat. Alright, let us proceed to the distinctions between pre-trial in civil cases and pre-trial in criminal cases. Now, pre-trial in civil cases, the complainant, the plaintiff, and the defendant is required to be present at the pre-trial as well as their respective counsel. In criminal cases, as was discussed earlier, it is the public prosecutor and the counsel for the accused only which is required to be present at the pre-trial in criminal cases as a general rule. Another distinction would be the effect of the absence in pre-trial of these persons. Now, in pre-trial in civil cases, the sanction for non-appearance is imposed upon the non-appearing party. Okay? This means that in civil cases, pre-trial in civil cases, um, which you will discuss in civil procedure, that if the complainant, the plaintiff, uh, fails to appear during pre-trial, then the civil case may be ordered dismissed. Now, if the defendant is the one who is absent, then the plaintiff may proceed to present his or her evidence ex parte. This is different from the absence of the lawyers, the prosecutor and the lawyer for the counsel for the accused is absent during pre-trial in criminal cases. Now, what is the effect? The proper sanctions and penalties, as we have discussed earlier, for non-appearance may be imposed upon the counsel for the accused or the prosecutor in case of failure to offer an acceptable excuse for lack of present or lack of cooperation as provided in Section 3, Rule 118. Now, another distinction. In pre-trial in civil cases, there is a consideration for the possibility of an amicable settlement or compromise. In pre-trial in criminal cases, this does not include the consideration of a possible amicable settlement of the criminal liability as one of its matters to be discussed or as one or as one of its purpose. Another distinction is in civil cases, the agreements and admissions may be contained in the record of pre-trial and pre-trial order. The minutes of preliminary conference may be signed by either the party or his counsel. Okay? The minutes may be signed either by the party or his counsel. While in while pre-trial in criminal cases, all agreements or admissions made or entered during pre-trial conference shall be reduced in writing and signed by both, again, signed by both the accused and counsel. Again, it must be signed by both the accused and counsel. Otherwise, they cannot be used against the accused. Okay? Last distinction, final distinction. Pre-trial in civil cases, a pre-trial brief is required to be submitted. Okay? It is specifically provided for in the rules in civil cases that pre-trial brief in civil cases is required to be submitted. However, in criminal cases, there is no such specific requirement that states that pre-trial brief is specifically required in criminal cases. All right, that concludes our discussions in arraignment, plea, and pretrial. My sincerest gratitude that you have taken the time to listen to this video. I hope that this video was instructive or at the very least, helpful. Thank you.